Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Kerrigan. Welcome, welcome to Witch Talk. My name is Kerrigan, and here we are again with one more episode of Witch Talk. This time we're going to talk about magic, and we're going to talk about Greco Egyptian magic. It's very, very good, and we have two, not one, but two guests today. <laughs> so it's a double deal, and it's very, very good because um, I think that this this uh, show it's full of surprises, and you you're going to know what I'm talking about when um, we begin the interview. Now, before we go anywhere any further, let me tell you how you can contact us on Witch Talk. Here we go. So, you want to know how to keep in touch with everything Witch Talk? Go to www.witchtalkshow.com and follow all the latest news. Listen directly to the show and enjoy it. Don't forget that all episodes of Witch Talk will be available to you on demand on Ustream. Click on Twitter, Facebook or Google Plus on our own Ustream page and spread the word. Don't forget to join us on Ustream Crowd. Go to www.ustream.tv slash channel slash witch talk dash show. Do you want to be part of the show? Join our incredible conversations live on every show right here on Witch Talk. Witch Talk will air every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or approximately 9 p.m. in most Europe. Now live in video, watch us on Ustream. Follow us on Twitter at Carrigan, K-H-A-R-A-G-A-N with an H after the K. Or send us an email at witchtalkshow at gmail.com. Now back to the show. And back to the show it is. Here we are again with one more fabulous uh, Witch Talk show. Um, they're all fabulous. I'm sorry. I have to say that. Um, Facebook. Yes, we do have a page. Everybody knows. And uh, it's a page that you can actually access and uh, get, you know, directly to us uh, and watch the show right there and then. And you can actually um, participate in the show from there also. So you have the chat room, you have everything. So you don't need anything else. We do have also um, another thing that I have to tell you, which is the Google+. Plus. I know that people are resisting it a lot, but it's a very, very nice environment. And if you try it, and if you do have a Gmail account, it's worth a try. Uh, we do have a page on Google+, Plus, and um, so go and visit us and follow us and everything. Else. So now we're going to introduce our guests for today and have this fantastic conversation about magic, one of my favorite subjects. So here we go. Tony Myerswicki has been practicing ceremonial magic since 1990. He has been running regular workshops and rituals recreating ancient magical practices in the United States and on the east coast of Australia since 2001. Tony Myerswicki is the author of Greco-Egyptian Magic, Everyday Empowerment, and a forthcoming premiere reconstructing classic Greek religion. He has contributed to various anthologies and magazines. He gives regular guest appearances and lectures at various pagans witchcraft and New Age events and has been on television and radio shows. In 1979, Joanne began learning her family magical tradition of mysticism and witchcraft through numerous long-distant calls to her grand-aunt in England until the aunt passed away in 2002. After practicing her family's tradition as a solitary for many years but waiting more, she was initiated and coven trained in 2001 through the Wiccan Order of Bast. She continued her training and in 2006 received the priesthood degree through the Hermetic Order of the Wiccan Mysteries. 
Joanne has been co-facilitating all of Tony's workshops in Australia and United States since 2004. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my guests today on Witch Talk, Tony and Joanne myers Wiki. Welcome, Joanne and Tony. How are you? We're fine, Carrigan. Thank you so much for having us on the show. We're very excited to be here. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Now, um, this is very exciting because, first of all, um, I'm, you know, obviously, I'm, you know, everybody, well, not everybody knows, but a lot of people know that I'm a witch, so I'm, I'm fascinating. I'm fascinated by um, by magic, as um, you know, all the witches. I hope they will be. And um, you have this wonderful, wonderful book um, called Greek of Egyptian Magic, and it happens to be, you know, I'm, I have this very, very um, close relationship with the Greeks and Egyptians, so it's a double deal. It's a double, you know, a double thing. So it's very good to have you here talking about all of this now. Let's begin with um, Joanne. Joanne, I know that you um, have this fantastic story about your aunt to tell us. How did you begin to be interested in paganism? Um, well, that kind of came out um, when my great aunt visited my house. And I caught my mom and her um, arguing about me um, being able to go back to England with her mm -hmm. and my mom didn't want me to and my aunt was kind of adamant that it would be important that I did but seeing as how my mother doesn't practice she was a little um, afraid of me joining the f tradition yes. in my family or yeah. some of the tradition I mean not all of my family practices mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, most of my family are Lubavitch Jews and live in Israel. Yes. Uh, <laughs> That's very interesting, actually. <laughs> so, well, no, the, tell, tell the really what's... funny thing is, ahead, is that ahead. the really funny thing is, is that the Lubavitch Jews are the ones that become the high rabbis, yeah. and the last test to become a high rabbi is to have knowledge of and the ability to practice magic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they get mad at me because one, I'm a woman, and I'm not supposed to be touching that, and yes. two, I'm not um, a practicing Lubavitch Jew. So that's two things that they're upset <laughs> with me about. <laughs> so you turn to England. You turn to your aunt in England. Now, what well, what part of England are we talking about? Um, just outside of London. Okay. All so right. it's 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 a proper upper class area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. The um, these sessions basically were secret phone conversations between my great aunt and myself behind my mother's back um, that took place from the time that I was about 15 mm -hmm. until she died um, about six or seven years later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, are we talking about the kind of witchcraft what what is this kind of witchcraft? What are we talking about? Are we talking about herbs and remedies and healing and what are we talking about? Because you know we know that in some parts of England they're still they're still um, teaching, and uh, you know cunning women and cunning men are still teaching yes. still you know in interrupted this is, traditions. Th yeah, this tradition is a family thing that um, came through Poland and. Um, and um, was intermixed with my grandfather's um, background, which is um, Ro Romani. So um, it, it's um, kind of a, a little bit of a synthesis. There's a lot of energy work, a lot of will mm -hmm. explanations. Mm -hmm. um, there's things on herbs. There's um, a laying of hands. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's it's um healing of energies basically it's not um you know any kind of energy surgery um mm -hmm. but there's um 
kind of a divination. Um, there's um, spell works and and folklore, and it's it's very involved. It's it's nothing that I can you know teach anybody in in two years or three years. It's something that you have to learn as you go, and it just gets more involved. Yes, of course, and more complicated. Now, um, you. Are an artist also, and and I'm sure that you begin very early on this, you know, on this uh, art. Now, um, is, is it true? Maybe not. Maybe she, um, actually, maybe you're going no. to say, well, actually, no. It's kind of like I began when I was like whatever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so when so, when did you begin this? Um, my my art. Um, well, I was I was always a pretty good drawer when I was a kid, but. Yes. For graphic art, it was mm. something I came in um, late in life after mm. I uh, divorced my first husband, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, I started laying out books for um, um, Emanu Megalithica, Manion Press, mm. and um, and then I began working with Peter Padden at Pendrag Publishing. Yes, yes. And that was that was it's amazing. We're going to see a couple of um of your covers in a minute. Now, um when did you begin I mean what when your aunt taught you these things and when you have those long conversations, did you know that that was witchcraft? Well that was It wasn't be, said it, it they she they didn't never say, said yeah, that's that witchcraft. Mm -hmm. It's or or it's this is just something we do. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That that was basically it. It was just something we do. Mm-hmm. And um, it's you know, everybody. Nobody likes to talk about a fam trad. I mean, that's just so passe. I know. <laughs> well, but it's it's very beautiful. You know, it's something that you know normally people don't really talk about it because it's private and it's a private thing. But well, you know, no, because it's passe. It's 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 like saying you know. I would never say that that my tradition is better than anybody else's tradition. I mean, yes, that's yes, that's. Yes. That's yeah. um, that's amazingly stupid. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is important, no matter how you get it and how you can practice it. Mm -hmm. It's it's just important that you continue the knowledge and pass it on. Mm -hmm. Now I know that you got your initiations. Um, also, you were trained in two thousand and one in the in the um, Wiccan Order of Bast. Now, why did you join these group? I mean, it's a different kind of thing, right? Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, is that my great aunt died, mm -hmm. and I was alone, and I didn't know what I should do at that point, and I didn't even know what any of this was, and I was going around with a friend of mine, and she wanted to go into these witch stores, and I'm like going, okay, whatever, and um, we went around to a you know a number of them in the area, and. Um, and there was one that was doing classes. And I thought, what the heck? It wasn't too expensive and it was close by and um, I might learn something that I don't already have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you went there. <laughs> yeah. Was it a big surprise? And was it a big surprise? Um, in, in looking back at it, it was kind of basic in comparison to what... To what you do. <laughs> what <laughs> I... Yeah. learned um, yeah. but the terminology was different and that's yeah. what I, I wanted to know you know is, is some of the terms that were used in the pagan world mm -hmm. and in the, in the community and I also wanted people you know I wanted a community I wanted to be able to talk to somebody about what we do yes yes you know, and I, I think, never had that. I, I, I think that, I, I don't know if you agree with me or not, um, I, I'm sure probably you, you probably had contact with now with other people that have the same experience as you, I mean, being in a tradition, in a, tra a family tradition. And um, sometimes it, this is what happens to people who have family traditions, who's the aunt, grandmother, whoever it is, dies. Then they're alone then they begin to search for something else for a community because they need that you know connection yes and continuity so they need that connection they need 
And people sometimes think, you know, there's this story, you know, I don't know if you know who, who Alexander's was, but he was the founder of the Alexandrian tradition um, of witchcraft, and um, which is one of the main, you know, uh, sects of Wicca. And some people say, you know, uh, oh, you know, he wrote to Patricia Crowder, which was a gar very well-known gardener and high priestess at the time, and he said that he, w he always wanted to be a witch. Well, he probably was, what he was doing before was um, a family thing. We don't know, right? And he really thought that it was he was alone. He was alone. He wanted to communicate with other witches. And why not write to, you know, someone who claimed to be in the television a witch? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, wow, there's more people like me. So, um, sometimes people don't really understand that. They don't really understand that family traditions are very special, but they sometimes, you know, people die and disappear, and you you're alone so you have to they're really very secular yeah yeah so i think you know it's it's very nice to have you explain that feeling because it's it's i think there's a lot um that can be explained by that actually now after that you got um some initiation all on, on the order of the wicked mysteries can you tell us a little bit more about this what is the order of uh, the hermetic order of the wicked of wicked mysteries um actually the um the coven that I had originally trained in um, died out. Mm -hmm. the the um, The HP kind of went away, mm -hmm. and um, the uh, young priest of the order mm -hmm. um, decided that he would carry it on, and um, he's he's really kind of carried it on 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 his own shoulders and. Um, he's he's an amazing young man, and um, I'm I'm really happy to have him in my life. That's great. That's great. That's great. Now, Tony, tell me. Yes. Uh, so this is this is whole the whole thing. We we did Joanne. Now we go for you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> You're turned on the spot, baby. Yes. <laughs> um, now, tell me, how did you begin being interested in the occult and into all of this? Um, I could probably go on for about an hour and a half detailing everything, but obviously we don't want to do that because there are far more important subjects to discuss. But I will say that I was brought up in a staunch Catholic household. I then moved into more mainstream Christianity. I did, however, read various books on the occult, but I always thought of them as being particularly evil and felt that it was something that I shouldn't be dabbling in. Mm -hmm. However, I found myself um, gradually getting into the occult, and actually one of my first introductions to particular occult tr practices came in the late 1980s from a transgender female friend of mine who was into tarot, crystals, and astral projection. Mm -hmm. And once I started to incorporate those practices, I found myself leaving mainstream Christianity behind and I embraced the Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, the Kabbalah is based on the Old Testament. So I felt that I wasn't falling it was like the fruit not falling too far away from the tree. I felt that I wasn't engaging in anything that was particularly wrong. Mm -hmm. So that then led me to, um, to Golden Dawn magic. And during that, I came across a book which was given to me by an ex-girlfriend written by a theologian who wrote about magical practices during the time of Christ. And he referred to the tradition of Greco-Egyptian magic. And so there were various spells where... A whole list of deities would be called on and occasionally they would call on the name of Jesus Christ as well. Mm -hmm. Of course the theologian concern was horrified. I was fascinated by it. When I first came across those particular texts um, I couldn't make head or tail of them. However, after many years of Kabbalistic practice I could then go back to them and make sense of them. So basically the book which I've written is a way of working with 
the various spells of the Greco-Egyptian magic. Oh, thank you, you've got it up. Of course of, I okay, do. I always do. I always do this <laughs> magic with television. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's absolutely yes. fantastic. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Go ahead, go ahead. So um, it's, it's a way of, of working with the spells of the period. Um, because the spells are difficult to work with, I've turned them into a system of planetary initiation. Basically, what I do is planetary initiation which leads to a system of ascension magic it's fundamentally theurgy which is a huge interest of mine theurgy is um basically god working um but at its at its heart it involves ascending to the to the realm of the gods mm -hmm. and experiencing god and a way of doing that is by ascending through the planetary spheres up to the realm of the stars and then to the realm of the gods so that's basically where my magic is headed. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's very interesting because, you know, you come from, I think, I think, I don't know if anybody did this research yet, but I think that 98% of the people that come into paganism or any form of occult or magic or whatever, uh, we come from um, um, Christian background or Catholic background or whatever it is, because that's the mainstream. That's what yes. you know, or any other. I mean, sometimes, but um, I, I, you know, but sometimes the reverse happens. Did you know that <laughs> sometimes people just go, yes. "Oh, sorry, I just have to go to uh, you know be a um, you know a Christian or a Catholic," and that's perfectly well, fine. It's it's. Well, when it w well, when it comes down to it, Carrigan, in mm. America, 76% of people identify as Christians. Yeah. So if people are going to get into paganism from anywhere, chances are it's, it's going to be from Christianity. Absolutely. And one thing which I've noticed over the years mm. is that many ex-Catholics wind up going into ceremonial magic. Because Absolutely. as a Catholic, you're going into a very ritualistic environment, you're smelling burning frankincense, you've got candles around you. It leads directly to ceremonial magic. Yes. It's kind of a portal, isn't it? Oh, Absolutely. Let's, just, let's go for <laughs> let's go for the ceremony of magic. Now, um, the other thing is that I think um, this this whole you know uh, uh, Greek or Roman, it's it's very interesting because you know you do have sects of the Catholic Church, especially the Catholic Church that is they have it in um, England, the liberate Catholic Church, which is yes. different and it's very accepting of you know, occult and, you know, and, uh, and all of that. So it's very interesting. It's another, you know, if people don't really want to, they want to hang on in there. Um, that's another, that's another choice, which is very interesting. And I do have a friend who is now a cat, uh, um, liberal Catholic priest, um, and uh, I don't know if they call it vicars or no. I think that it's priest. It's just priest, and um, mm -hmm. he uh, he's a third degree Alexandrian. So it's very interesting. Um, wow. Yeah. So uh, let's look at this fantastic book. It's called Greco Egyptian Magic Everyday Empowerment. Tony. Now, Tony, tell me your name again, please. Last one. <laughs> Tony Mizwiki. Mizwiki, yes. yes. Okay. It's not easy, people, okay? It's not easy to pronounce <laughs> these things. Mizwiki. Um, with the, pre the preface uh, by Donald Michael Craig, which he, you know, he's your friend, and also um, he was here on Witch Talk in the past, so it's absolutely amazing. Now, one of the particular things about this book is that this book is has actually the real deal. I mean, th this is real documents that we're talking about, and you worked yes. with real documents, which is, you know, you. I kind of like look at the back of the books, and, you know, sometimes they're so unpersonal. They're just like, you know, blah, 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 was born in blah, 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 and worked in blah, blah, blah for how many years, and da, 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 and this book is showing you da, da, da. This back of the book is very, it's talking to you. Directly, it's very un you know unpersonal. It's very you know this is what it is. We have real b real documents here. If you want to do it, that's how it goes. If you don't, just put back the book again in the shelf. You know. Thank you very so much. It's, yeah. it's really it's really really very direct, um, and it's absolutely amazing the way you put it together. Now I really want to go through the book because I think that it's necessary, and um, for you to explain a little bit more about this. Um, sure. So tell me a little bit more about uh, Greco-Egyptian magic and why are they together? Because sometimes people ask that. Why Greco-Egyptian? Why why can't we just talk about 
Egyptian magic and Greek magic. So why are they together? Okay, it's a system of magic that came into being between the 2nd century BC and the 5th century AD. It was mm -hmm. a time in history during which there was a huge amount of cross-cultural mixing. So it was a time that gave rise to, to various movements such as Neoplatonism, Hermeticism, Mithraism, mm -hmm. and so on. So while these are thought of as being um, uh, almost philosophical movements, the thing is that the magic of the time represented the same sort of cross-cultural mixing. So as the name implies, Greco-Egyptian magic is primarily Greek and Egyptian. Mm -hmm. However, there are also Sumerian and Babylonian influences, Hebrew influences, and a very light sprinkling of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So th that's, that's towards the very end. So, so it's an amalgamation. The reason why I'm so drawn to it is apart from having um, amazing collections of spells that we can dip into, mm -hmm. we know how to pronounce all the words of power because they're in Koine Greek. Koine Greek means common Greek and it's the language of the New Testament. We know exactly how to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. Egyptian magic is incredibly powerful. However, the pronunciation of the Egyptian language has been lost. What Egyptologists do is that they look at the Coptic language, which is the last flowering of the Egyptian language, and work backwards and guess how to pronounce the Egyptian words of power. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so at best, all you're getting is a guess. Whereas with the stuff that I'm working with, we know how to nail the pronunciation. And mm -hmm. for me, pronunciation is incredibly, incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, for me too. But you know, <laughs> some people say it doesn't really matter. What it matters is your intention. Is that true? Um, the intention is very important as well. But yes. I think you, you need the pronunciation. That's why I have a CD that goes along with the book that has the pronunciation of all the words of power on it. Yes. You need, you need both. I mean, I use a very minimalist approach. I, I use incense and essential oil, and I use my voice, and that's it. I'm not really into dress up and all that sort of thing. So if you, you're getting by with a minimalist approach, you have to make sure that, that your pronunciation is spot on and that you're using the, the, the correct essential oils and incenses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, the, the other thing that I think that this book is, is amazing is that it's, it's, you really are um, leading uh, every, uh, you know, the, the, the reader to... This is a system. This is a system in itself. Yes. Um, and you go through the planets and everything. And then you do have an appendix too, which I just love because it's about what we talked about. It's pronunciation exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very neat. Yes. Uh, vowels, uh, diphthongs, consonants and all of that. Um, mm -hmm. And then you do have a little bit on the appendix one about the background of Greco-Egyptian magic. I'm a little bit mad, as you can tell, <laughs> because I'm beginning... <laughs> From the back of the book to the to the beginning of the book, nobody does that. But you know, uh, I, I I do as well sometimes. I, I, I like know, to start with the appendices. See, yeah, why not? You know, why? <laughs> yeah. You know, I know the title. You know what I mean? I know what it is about. So let's just go into the appendices because you know sometimes there's pearls in the appendices that you don't Absolutely. really. Absolutely. You know. So let's talk about the appendices now. Uh, another thing. Now that we have here, um, you know, the book, and I really really like to um, to to talk about this because I think that it's something that people don't really talk about and I'm sure that Joanna will appreciate this um, <laughs> the photo that it's on the cover of this book it's t uh, it was t was t was taken by Joanne right no it's another no, 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 Joanne um, well no no, no. Jo Joanne actually took took the the photo of me on the back cover oh, um, but so the, it's not but the photo of the cover no, no, no. The, the cover was actually produced by a very gifted artist named Vincent Chong. He oh, uses okay. a multimedia approach. Cold and cover, yes, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. And the yeah. thing is that I, I gave him the main themes within uh, the book. And if you look carefully at the cover, he's captured every single theme there. Yes. So he's got, um, uh, he's got a number of the, he's got a couple of the Egyptian gods at the top. He's got the mask of Tutankhamun to, to represent the, um, the Egyptian influence. Um, he's got the representations of the zodiac symbols so that you can, oh, sorry, the planetary mm -hmm. symbols. So you can see that you're working with a system of planetary yes. magic. And if you look very, Let's very carefully, mm -hmm. you, you can see a hand holding a cell phone and there's also um, a hand over a keyboard. So what it's representing is that it's a system of planetary magic 
that involves Greco-Egyptian spells brought into the 21st century. Yes, yes. Um, it, it's amazing how much he's actually captured in that cover. Oh, so I thought, he's, he's I thought a, that it was Joanne. Joanne, why didn't you do this one? We wanted you to do this. <laughs> well, his <laughs> book is you. actually what brought me into doing book covers oh. and and the interior layouts. The publisher was not able to embed the um, interesting fonts that are used um, in in his book, mm -hmm. and um, they were having trouble and. I just stayed up one night and and did it and sent it to the publisher and they used it and then they came back at me and said would you like to help us with other books and I said sure <laughs> and so that you know it would yeah. be fun yeah. I enjoy it this is something yes. that I enjoy it was a dream to to start working on um on books to begin with and um so from there it led to more books and then um, I started working with Peter Patton and Pendrag Publishing and it was um, it was really you know a dream come true for me it's very very interesting I just love it I really I really do so this was your trigger right this was the book that triggered you to yeah. become a successful um, artist and, <laughs> and um, book designer. Now, um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is that, um, you know, the cover is for, by Vincent Chong. Um, then you have the photo was by Joanne, but it's your photo in the back. Um, let's, let's go on the, on the... Another thing that I like about the book is that you talk a little bit about the mythology um, in each of them. You do have... Um, I think is one of the appendices is that uh, you talk about uh, a little bit about the background of Egyptian Greco-Egyptian magic, which is always good. Um, <laughs> don't attempt this if you don't know what you're doing. So <laughs> it's always <laughs> it's always good to have an information about what you really are actually doing and dabble with. Um, and so one of the questions that I got from your book was um, someone emailed me. I think um, was that. Christian magic? What do you mean Christian magic or Christian influence? Christian magic, you say, um, uh, you know, you, you talked about the Egyptian, the Greeks, and, you know, also Christian. Uh, and, and they said, you know, I never knew that Christianity had that, you know, that had that magic or magic or anything like that I never knew because I always thought about magic being something that it's you know related to other cultures um, and other religions how do you answer that um, very simply Christians came from paganism so as pagans vir virtually all pagans practice magic so coming into Christianity they maintain their magical practices now what happened in Egypt was that people would come to the priests for advice and for, for for the performance of various magical rites. Now, once paganism was suppressed and Christianity took off, the people still expected to get magical help from the Egyptian priests. And there actually is a tradition of magical practice within Coptic Christianity. So there's a wonderful text that's edited by Marvin Meyer called Christian Magic, and it has a whole lot of spells which were practiced by members of the Coptic Church. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, when you look at those particular spells, structurally they're very, very similar to the Greco-Egyptian tradition from which they came. But what they've done is that they've removed all the words of power and have replaced them with references to the to the angels, mm -hmm. Jesus, Mary, you know, God and the like. Mm -hmm. So and by doing that, as far as I'm concerned, they've disempowered the system. You know, mm -hmm. the Chaldean oracles say to never change the barbarous names of invocation. Mm -hmm. You always keep those constant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, so, y y so yes, there is a tradition of Christian magic. Yeah. And, um, and actually, that particular tradition has been traced through to the Geisha by at least one author. The idea of calling on strings of, of deities and, and daemons together, that, that occurs in the Geisha. And then winds up permeating through the practice of ceremonial magic to, to this day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you still practice ceremonial magic, uh, Tony? Um, today? today? Not anymore? No, no, not, not as really. such. Um, mm. 
I've basically replaced it with with Greco Egyptian magic. Mm -hmm. um, in, in case you're curious, the, the way these, the way my workshops came about was that I wanted to introduce Greco Egyptian spells to the pagan community in Australia mm -hmm. and I started to use a golden dawn ritual called the watchtower ritual and I would mm -hmm. place an authentic invocation in the middle of it but after running those rituals a number of times I then started to remove the golden dawn elements until eventually I came up with a framework ritual there was an opening rite and a closing rite that were taken solely from texts um, that were part of the Greco Egyptian tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and attendees at that particular workshop told me that what I'd come up with was at least as effective as the Golden Dawn stuff that I was working with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was when I thought, okay, I'm onto something. And I threw out all my Golden Dawn workings and substituted with this. Now, I'm not saying that what I'm doing is better, everything's subjective. It's a case of this works really well for me and it works well for other people that have used it. But if someone is far happier working with the Golden Dawn tradition or chaos magic or what have you, they should stick with what they're comfortable. I, I don't believe that anything anything is anything is is an ultimate magical tradition. It's it's all purely subjective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now tell me. Let, let's talk about the, the the book and how you know. Now we're going to talk about the beginning of the book. <laughs> um, let's talk about the opening rite and 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 then you have like this commentary on the opening rite. Now why are we doing an opening rite uh, with the planetary, you know, rituals? Um, the thing is that coming from a ceremonial magic background, um, I used to do the lesser banishment ritual, the pentagram, before mm -hmm. and after every ritual. So I felt that I needed something to do at the beginning and end of every ritual. So the opening rite that I'm using is, actu is actually a substitute for the LBRP. Mm -hmm. um, it actually comes from the, from the invocation of a god called Ogdoas, who's the god over the over the eighth sphere and the eighth sphere is obviously over the seven planetary spheres so I felt comfortable working with that because he basically has rulership over all the spheres underneath him but over and above that um, what you're doing is you're creating a sacred space that you can work in you're not working within a circle there's no evidence of the Greco Egyptian magicians working within a circle but they did need a sacred space so rather than working with the four with the um, four direction system that most people are familiar with, we work with a seven direction system where you're not actually um, tracing out a circle for protection. You just face each of the seven directions. We like to refer to that as calling the sevenths, and you do that through vowel chants. Mm -hmm. The, the vowels basically open up portals into the mm -hmm. seven directions, allowing for a free flow of energy, and that then puts you into a space where you're centered, it's a sacred space, and then, you, then you're ready to do the working. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's my ceremonial magic background coming through. Uh, it's very good. Uh, <laughs> it's just very good. I just love <laughs> it. Um, okay, and, and then we begin in the moon, right? We begin in mm -hmm. the moon, and, and there is in, in the... Um, each of the... Now, I wanted you to explain to a little bit about this, because, you know, this was another question that we're, we got... Um, why do we have initiations in every one of them? I think that that question comes on, you know, not really understanding what the book is about, but um, you, can t you can explain a little bit more about that. Why do we have a procedures for initiation in each one of them? Um, so, why? Okay, um, the reason why I called the book Planetary Empowerment mm -hmm. is that, or sorry, Everyday Empowerment, is Everyday. that, um, a as you know, every day is aspected to a planet. And in some languages, the, pla the the names of the planets are actually uh, are ac are actually still there in the names for the days of the week. Um, that's largely lost in the English language. However, you know, Saturday is Saturn Day, Sunday is the day of the sun, Monday comes from Moon Day, and then for the remaining days of the week, um, it actually comes from different traditions. So. So Tuesday comes from Tuis, which which is attributed to the war god Mars. Um, Wednesday is Woden's Day, which is aspected to um, Hermes or Mercury. Thursday, Thor's Day, um, god of god of lightning, a sky god attributed to Zeus and Jupiter. Friday, Freya Day, which is attributed to Aphrodite and the planet Venus. Mm -hmm. So by working a system of planetary initiation, you can then 
take advantage of the primary energies that permeate each day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to uh, let's go to this first, um, and we get we get a sense of what it is if we go to the first one, um, and it's just amazing. It's really really beautiful. First of all, mm -hmm. you do have um, uh, you know what what you have to all of, all of the things that you have to go fit it for for each one of them right and you list right. them you have uh, the goddess invoked the key properties um, you then you have the fragrance the color the gemstone anything and then you have the mythology just in case you don't know yep. <laughs> so I've tried to make the whole thing soft and it's just very nice because it's Thank very you. you know it's very it's very um, summarized it's not a huge mythology I mean what is it about? but it's a you know, the sufficient amount of information so that you will know what you're doing in each of the of the stages, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, because, um, you know, some books don't do that. Some books just give you, you know, they assume you know who Hermes is, you know what I mean? And that's yes. it. Um, and then now, or don't give you any fragrance or any incense or whatever, and then you're kind of mixing things by yourself, which is sometimes not really good, because they're wrong, <laughs> wrong choices, <laughs> you know. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the, the I was just going to say that the other thing is that um, you go th when I started getting into this sort of thing, I'd look mm -hmm. at various books, and they would come up with correspondences mm -hmm. for the planets. And I'd look at a particular correspondence and I'd think, okay, that makes sense. But then you'd mm -hmm. pick up another book and they would use different correspondences. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to know where those correspondences came from. So all the correspondences which I use can be taken back to the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's all taken from source texts. Um, the other pet gripe that I have with many other books which I was reading is that authors would tell you to perform various rituals, but then at the end of it, you didn't really know what to expect. So what I did was after running these rituals for um, four, four and a half years with various groups, I summarized their results and picked out the common elements in people's results and put them in the book so that that then gives you an idea of what you can expect when you work those particular spells because when it comes down to it this tradition was destroyed by the Christians it was gone by the fifth century the the last spells that we have in this tradition go back to the fifth century so it's not a living tradition um, we're having to rediscover it yes and uh, um, and by working with this stuff um, you start to learn more and more about it absolutely well, do you believe in um, in um, direct channel when you're doing these things that some things come to you? Yes, you know, absolutely. <laughs> um, the, th the thing, but the thing is that the messages which come th well in reconstructionist circles that's referred to as UPG, unverified personal gnosis. Yes. Um, but the information which you channel. Um, tends to be of a subjective nature. It's mm -hmm. true for you. It may not necessarily be true for anyone else. Mm -hmm. However, once you have a number of people channeling basically the same information, then you know you're onto something. When it comes down to it, um, paganism in ancient times was a living tradition. It grew, it developed. And because more and more of us are practicing it now, mm -hmm. um, I can see it starting to grow and take off. Um, rather than giving people information which I've channeled, I tend to only give stuff that's taken directly from source texts because mm -hmm. that's stuff that can't really be contradicted because it's, it's there, it's, it's set in stone. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that the people can um, have an issue with me over is my interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. But you know, I invite people to, to have a look at the source text which I used and then come up with their own interpretations and if they can come up with a better interpretation that works better for them then great go for mm -hmm. it I mean that's yeah. how I came up with this after all ultimately we should all come up with our own path yes of course of course now you do have um, on on this you have meditation and Eucharist um, can you tell us a little bit more about that because you know some people ask me what what is Eucharist what is Eucharist um, the idea of a Eucharist, well, we tend to think of Eucharist as being something particularly Christian. 
mm -hmm. um, but it's been embraced by various pagan groups. You bring um, some sort of food or some sort of drink into the circle and it absorbs energy and it can then be consumed. However, um, it was used in, in pre-Christian times. When it comes down to it, the whole Christian mass mm -hmm. comes out of Mithraism. And there was a part in the Mithraic mass where the priest would hold up a wafer and he'd say, behold, you know, this is, this is my body, and, and uh, then he'd hold up a, um, a chalice and say, this is my blood. And the words that were used by the Mithraists were exactly the same mm -hmm. as those which, which were then used by the, um, by the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, which is one of the reasons why Mithraism was so brutally suppressed by the Catholic Church because they didn't want people realizing where Mithraism had come from. Initially they started saying that, um, that Mithraism was a counterfeit of Christianity. However, intellectuals at the time realized that Mithraism predated Christianity. So then you had some of the church fathers saying that the devil had come along and had preempted the coming of the one true faith and it created this this counterfeit that preempted Christianity. You know, which is basically double talk. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. They are very good at that. Very good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very yes, good. sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then you have uh spells not used, uh and you you do have a list uh here which and not being incorporated into this ritual. And, and you do have the list of them, and um, and then you do have the other thing is the procedure for initiation. Now, what is what do you really understand here as initiation? Are we being initiated into into the planet? What what is this? I know that initiation obviously is the beginning, but what are we talking about here? Is it a, what, what is what is this right? Okay. Initiation doesn't actually occur within a sacred space. It occurs in everyday life after the rite. So basically you go into the rite, you open up a doorway to allow a particular planetary energy or, or deity energy to come into you and then it starts to work changes and those changes then manifest through everyday life. So uh, I don't think that you have any major changes that take place at the ritual itself, it's a flow-on effect that takes place over over an extended period of time. That's actually why I encourage people to keep working with these energies repeatedly mm -hmm. until they find that they've gotten as much benefit out of them as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, the wonderful thing about this system is as you start working through the planets, by the time you get to the sun, the sun corresponds to Tifereth, which is in the middle of the Tree of Life. And that's where you gain access to your HGA, your Holy Guardian Angel, the Higher Self. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where most books on magic peter out. They stop at that point. They take you as far as the portal grade and point you in the right direction. Okay, gain access to your HGA, and then after that, you're on your own. Um, you come across references to um, crossing the abyss and, and working your way to Bina, but very few texts actually show you the way to get there. One of the exceptions to that is Mart Magic by Nima, which is an absolutely wonderful text which gives you instructions for ascending up the Tree of Life, going all the way up the Tree of Life, and she uses a very flexible approach so that you can um, either use Martian magic or use straight Thelemic magic or use whatever systems work properly for you. When the sequel to Greco Egyptian magic comes out, I'll actually have my own system in place for taking you all the way experiencing all the planets. And there's actually a one-to-one -one correspondence between this planetary system and the Tree of Life. It amounts to the same thing. And when is that coming out? <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> it's, it's thank you. I know, I know, Joanne. <laughs> I feel you. I know what you're thinking. Yes. <laughs> It's, it, it's, it's been a long time coming. I'm, I'm trying to get a book on, it's, it's a reconstruction of Greek religion finished. As soon as I get that finished, I'll then go back to, to working on the sequel to Greek Egyptian magic. It's, it, it's, it's been a long time coming. I but know, um, I, 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 I do intend to do it, and Joanne keeps hitting me upside the head, <laughs> trying to motivate <laughs> and a, me, and a, which and is apparently probably me what I need. Yeah, and apparently me too, because we're kind of like everybody now knows. So every expect a lot of uh, back in the head kind of thing from no one, because this is public. Now the twenty. Everybody help me, please. Yes, they will. Don't worry, Joanne. <laughs> 
Now, 28 visions. This is very, very interesting. Um, and then you have like a lot of things here. So 28 visions. What is this? Um, no, you do have the procedures for initiation. Let's go a little bit back. Um, and then you summarize the process of ritual preparations, to, you know, that should be done. And then the results. You talk a little bit about the results. And th these are results. What is the, these are results that you verified happening the, to, the, to people the, or group that you worked with. Okay, I've I've worked with groups in yeah. um, on the east coast of Sydney, basically in Sydney mm -hmm. and the Gold Coast, and I've also worked in groups in the United States. So, mm -hmm. I've had groups in um, in California, in Ohio, Florida, New York State, Minnesota. I've I've worked these rituals with all of them, and people have various results. And what I've done is I've picked the eyes out of their results and incorporated them together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, just I've put in the commonalities, you know, the, the elements of the, the common elements, so that if people work this system of magic, they have a reasonable idea of what they're going to experience. Now, I've had a number of people that have zoned out, gone into amazing head spaces where they come up with epic visions. And um, with my Gold Coast group, it, it almost seemed like there were two girls who would go into competition <laughs> against each other to see who'd come up with the most epic vision. But the thing is that those epic visions tend to be um, meaningful to that person. So what I was looking at were just the elements of commonality between them. And there, there invariably are elements of commonality. And for me, it's absolutely priceless when I work a ritual and I have two people in this sacred space with me who don't know each other but have very similar results and just mm -hmm. seeing them staring at each other it's like oh my god we've just had the same vision but we don't know each other so the only connection they've ever had is yes. by standing in the sacred space with us Yes. now presence uh, of energy in the ritual area this is something that I never ever um, mm. saw in a book which is uh, what would you expect feel in terms of energy or what um, kind of energy are you are you you know is it is it am i correct um again it it depends on the person um mm. for me i i feel i and and also on the ride itself i mm. feel i feel my body starting to move i had a guy on the gold coast who was in his 60s and as soon as the energy would hit the circle i keep calling it a circle but it's actually a sacred space mm -hmm. his arms would come up and his arms would stay up during the entire length of the ritual. And that might be 15 or 20 minutes. And I defy you to stand there with your arms out straight like the archetypal zombie, you know, for 15, <laughs> 20 minutes. And yet, this 60-year-old guy would do just that. Mm. It was almost like having a canary in a mine shaft. You know, we'd mm -hmm. see Leo's arms go up and it's like, okay, we know there's energy in the circle. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. yeah Wow. Also, he wound up experiencing a healing as a result of, of one of my rituals. Now, I, it was an invocation of Ares, the war god. Now, I never would have thought of using Ares for healing. However, um, one of the things that happens when you experience an, an Ares energy is that you feel 10 foot tall and bulletproof. So he felt, he felt 10 foot tall and bulletproof and basically made an affirmation to himself that he would feel better. He would get better. He had driven taxis for many, many years. Now, the following morning after the ritual, instead of turning to one side and using his arms to lift himself up, he sprang out of bed. First time he'd done that in years. And, you know, at first I thought about it, why would Aries work for a, for a healing rite? And then in the end it dawned on me that um, someone who's out on the battlefield also has to be able to heal his comrades at arms. Mm -hmm. it, it, make, it makes perfect sense. And the thing is, we tend to pigeonhole go our gods. So um, we, we tend to think of, okay, Ares is just a war god and that's it. But his functions um, are far greater than that. And if you go through the ancient Greek texts, you start to find just how varied the functions of the various gods are. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if you have a connection with one particular god, then there are so many things that you can get by just focusing on that one god. Not that I'm advocating neglecting the other gods, but you know you can get most of what you need just from the one god. It's just amazing because I'm kind of going through all of this, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> little bits of information that you give here, and it's so 
thorough. Um, you have, you know, experience through non-physical sense, um, messages received, uh, astral experiences, quality of energy. Never, ever, ever I saw this in a book. Um, it's just so amazing how you guide people. I think that it really, it's cl clearly, this is, a w first of all, a well-thought process, Mm -hmm. an experience that you, you had, but you do have this sense, uh, we get this sense of caring from you, which is something that sometimes, you know, authors don't really um, go for. Um, you're very caring in the way that you want to make sure that everybody will kind of, you know, be okay in the process, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's very interesting the way you put all of these things in. Um, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but this is the way that it comes, uh, you know, from the reading. It's almost having you there, you know, and kind of like go through it. And it's really kind of not um, very pompous because sometimes books like this can be pompous. They can have this very thick text and very <laughs> deep into this kind of, oh my god, we're talking about magic papari and Egyptian Greek and Mexican papari and all of this. I mean, it can't be very thick. No, you're not. It's just, you know, it's very, very explicit, very easy to follow, and very um, caring. I get this caring. You know, you're almost wow. having, you know, yeah. This is, I, I think it's very good. It's really, really absolutely amazing. Now, his How? caring comes through on the CD as well. Yeah, well, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. So Gosh, can I get you to do all my PR for me? Oh, no. <laughs> well, I'm d that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> I just love to do this because I think that it's necessary. When we have, we don't, let's just say, we don't have every author there is in the show for a reason. We do read the books and we do choose wisely. <laughs> <laughs> if you know well. what I mean, <laughs> because it's really something that I don't want to put um, out things on Witch Talk that really, you know, and, and the, you know, the people that are listening to us know this. Um, sometimes it's something that people want to see or want to have on the show. Oh, I would love to have Mark Allen Smith or I would love to have this or that. But um, if we don't think that it's really an amazing author that has this amazing message, um, we are a whole world full of people. And there are so many extraordinary people and authors. And there are so many non-extraordinary people and authors. You know, there are some books, and we have to acknowledge this, they are just not good. Um, but they are there, and, and they might serve, you know, of triggers to something else, or, you know, you just jump from that to another one, that it's absolutely fantastic. You know, mm. so they do have their purpose. But when we feel that the author is really extraordinary and have this extraordinary vision, that's when we want them in the show. So, here we are. So now, wow. the, the other, th <laughs> the other thing, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> the other thing is that, how long does it take for us? Uh, it didn't take. It didn't took much for me to know how to pronounce it, because I come from, you know, um, it, it's. I come from Europe, so it's kind of. Uh, I don't know. It's easy for me to pronounce it. Um, you know, I'm talking about the voice magic eye, but. But is it very difficult for for people to? Did you get that feedback that it's very difficult for them to get around the pronunciation of these um, voice magic eye or not? Ag again, it depends on the person, and mm -hmm. that's actually why I recorded a CD, the CD yeah. with 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 all the rituals on it, so that what people can, mm. because it has the rituals in their entirety on it, they can just hit the play button on their CD player and follow the text. Now the thing is, after having listened to the CD a number of times, they start to pick up on the pronunciation and realize just how easy it is. Now the thing with the CD is that we had to walk a fine line between having a dry mix, which is very easy to follow, and something that's sort of a little bit spacey, a little bit trippy. We needed something that was a combination of the two. And the result that we've got is we're very happy with it, and even people who don't have a magical background feel energy when they listen to it and that's why the CD comes with a warning to not listen to it in your car 
<laughs> while you're driving or, or not operating heavy machinery because yes. we do not want people zoning out while now, they're doing something potentially dangerous. This is very, very interesting, Tony and, and Joanne, and I think that this is uh, something that I came across with um, a very well-known blogger in our community, um, and uh, she told me we released a CD also, which is kind of in the same range of your CD. Um, right. It's it's ritual, so it's it's kind of a you know, and it has an historic value, um, and it also has um, um, a trigger value, which is to prompt you to know more or further you know research about it. Um, mm -hmm. And she was very, very um, strong opinionated about the fact that uh, she thought that that was entertainment and that could not be done because it's considered to be entertainment. Do you think that your CD is entertainment? No, de def <laughs> definitely not. Me neither. <laughs> but she thinks that, you know, not of your CD in particular, but of... Uh, our CD. Our CD is basically something that was published in '71, and by Alex Sanders, and it's basically part of rituals. Um, and it's very beautiful. It's very beautiful. It's done by him in a studio in London '71 again, and we remaster it because you know it was original in um, in a record. You know, like a. Um, Pla not plastic. What is it called? Um, a vinyl. Vinyl. V vinyl. Vinyl. Uh, vinyl. So we remaster it, and uh, and we published it. And she was really, really upset about that. So I guess that you know, that's a good thing. I think we've had people. We've <laughs> had people decide to play this while right before going to sleep, and had yes. very prophetic dreams while oh, they wow. played it. That's so very it's it's something that can really touch into your subconscious. This mm. is not entertainment. No, no, of course not. Why would it be? Why would exactly. it be? Exactly, and and in the case of the of the um CD that you were talking about, your Alexander CD, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that is something extremely important to people within the Alexandrian tradition because they can hear the voice of their founder. Yeah, and also yeah. it's something that can be experienced by other people as well. I mean, he's yeah. someone who did lead a magical life. You yeah, know, it's it's much it's much the same. It's much the same deal with, with Alistair Crowley. I yes, it is have, the same I, thing. Do you think I, I that have, that's entertainment? <laughs> Do you think that this is entertainment? No, no. Well, the thing so. is that with, with the Crowley CD, he actually has a couple of invocations on it, mm. and, there are his, and there's his poetry as well. Mm. I would consider his poetry to be largely entertainment, I suppose. I mean, I, I, I do enjoy it, mm -hmm. but there may well be shades of meaning that would be accessible to people who are yeah. very much into thelemic magic that, that elude me. I, don't, I wouldn't think that ritual, uh, recorded ritual, would be entertainment. I don't look no. at it that way, but, you know, some people do. All right, so let, back to the uh, Greco-Egyptian magic <laughs> again. Everyday yes. Empowerment um, by uh, Tony... Here we go. Tony uh, Musewick. Ms. Wiki. Ms. Yes. Wiki. Yes. All right. So, <laughs> uh, you know, you don't, you don't know. I had a lot of other names, very, very complicated. Um, and you know, it is what it is. So you, you really have to. But it's, it's. Uh, sometimes you do, you do carry the name for, for, for your entire life. You know how to pronounce it, and it's very, very difficult. That's for why someone. I kept my maiden name. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I so know what you're talking about. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, tell me, what is the back feedback of this book? And I'm not talking about people that you actually gave workshops. I'm talking about people that don't know you, never met you. What is the feedback about this and the CD? The feedback has actually been very good. Um, if you look at the reviews on Amazon, for instance, um, they're all very, very positive. And while I do know some of the people who posted those reviews, there are other people who I've never met. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, if you, if you Google the book, you'll come across other reviews. And they, they've, all been, they've all been reasonably positive. They, they've ranged from positive to very positive. There have been no negative reviews. That's good. That's very good. And if there is, we don't read them. <laughs> Just actually, actually, I I disagree. If if there is a negative review, you um, want to I would, read it. 
I, I want to read it and I want to see if, if there's a mistake, if there's a mistake somewhere or if I've done something wrong. Um, mm. Actually, there was, there was one review which I had where um, a friend of mine pointed out that there's, there's something which I should have clarified in the book because I refer to a Greco-Egyptian tradition. He mm. pointed out that there wasn't the one tradition. You had numerous magicians practicing very similar Mm-hmm. sort of magic. You know, it's much the same as with, um, you look at Strega today, where you have various families practicing yes. Strega. So mm-hmm. there will be elements of commonality between what they're all doing, but mm-hmm. it's not the one tradition. That, mm-hmm. That's my understanding of mm-hmm. it anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I uh, sometimes, you know, people do say bad things about what you do just for the sake of bad just because they wanted to, just because there is no reason, the, the work is fine, but, um, and you don't really learn anything about it. So over the years, I've, I've read so many things about the, you know, I'm talking about the show, but it can be applied to any other, you know, medium, uh, books or whatever, um, that are not constructive, you know, uh, enough. Um, but I do read them. You know, I do read them, all of them, all of them. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, um, okay, that's the that's the difference between a rant and constructive criticism. Absolutely, absolutely, a rant. I mean, we, exactly. I mean, we all welcome constructive criticism. I mean, yes. you grow, yeah. you improve through yeah. constructive criticism. But if someone just wants to be negative for the sake of being negative, that that doesn't help anyone. No, no, not at all, not at all. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom, uh, Tony um, Muswicky and uh, his fantastic... Did I pronounce it well? I did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was fast. Greco-Egyptian Magic Everyday Empowerment. And this is um, a book that is uh, uh, published by uh, Megalictic Book Publication. So Megalictic, Megalictic Books, I think. And um, by... I'm a Nyan Press, right? Imanian. Imanian Press. Imanian Press, yes, dot com. Yes. So you can actually, it's www.immanion slash press and then dot com. So, um, but you can go to your website, right? And can buy That's it? correct. From there? Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, if, and, then, and of course, we can autograph it if they get it directly from us. Absolutely, absolutely. And they can get the CD from us as well. That's great. I just, if they buy both, they get a deal. So that's good. That's a wonderful thing, actually. Um, what about, uh, do we have, um, Do uh, d- did you ever thought about a DVD? <laughs> <laughs> um, Here we go. <laughs> the... Well, we thought about it very briefly, mm. but mm. the rituals aren't particularly dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, they're they're more a ca- they're they're very basic. They're, it's more a case of calling in the energies and sitting there or laying there, mm-hmm. feeling the energies and so on. There's there's no dancing. There's well, there's no drumming or anything else. They they wouldn't be particularly entertaining to look at. When we do the opening right, you would see how we kind of move around to the different um, directions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how we have certain hand movements and stuff, yes, but other yes. than that, I mean, they're all explained in the book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I would it, think I was thinking of like you know, um, you know, kind of a, an image of someone doing the opening and the closing and one of the rituals, for instance, and then kind of like see the gestures, see the you know, and it's the same thing as the audio basically, but with image. You know what I mean? I just um, thought about it. So well, I like I said, the the <laughs> only the only bit of movement you'd see would be during the opening right and the closing right. Then you'd have a whole lot of people standing or sitting or laying there, feeling the energies. It's yeah, yeah. Th- it would not make for entertaining yeah, viewing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Or explanation. I mean, I was more thinking about in the in the modes of explanation, like image explanation of the things. But oh. you know, like kind of. Uh, I think I think that would be nice. But you know, it's it's you know, if it is in the CD and the book, it's sufficient, I think. But I just I just asked because I thought that you know you would you would think you know I don't know if you thought You'd about it. You have to it. talk with Peter about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, Peter, I mean, if yeah, you're I listening mean, to us, <laughs> just you know, kind of like you know, it's an idea. It's not in demand. <laughs> it's an idea, and it's yeah. But what what are you saying? I'm sorry, Tony. You were saying I, I was I, I was just saying that um you know if, if if there was a demand for it we could do it but um yeah, yeah. 
I, I, like I said, I, I just don't know how exciting it'd be. It's having it's it's like having uh, you know Tony uh, Muzwiki in a in a box. It's well, everybody great. would like to look at <laughs> you him. Know I mean, I mean? look at you know what so I mean? You know what I mean? Yes, Joanne. <laughs> See, yes, yes. All right, so. <laughs> <laughs> Greco Egyptian magic, everyday empowerment, Tony Muzwiki. Now, um, in the end, um, and you, I'm sure that you, you, you had a lot of students and people that were really actually practiced this with you for so long. Um, what is the result of all of this work? Obviously, the fan, the, it's different from everybody, I know, but you know, in a general, what do you think? Um, basically, it leads to self empowerment. Mm -hmm. All I see myself as as a cosmic concierge, a door opener. I basically open up the doors to let in divine energies, and mm -hmm. I l allow people to interact with those energies. But ultimately, they should be doing it all themselves. Once they start channeling divine messages, then they can start living um, a better life, a more empowered life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that's that's the name of the game: self empowered, mm -hmm. becoming yeah. the, the best person that you can be. Now, uh, there is a question in the chat room. That oh, I hold on. Can I, can I just say one more thing? Um, yes, go ahead. You know, we're, we're not interested in setting up a permanent group or a coven. Um, we see this, these sort of rituals as like a school. You go in, you master them, you graduate, then you move on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then um, you do you know, other things. Yeah, you, then you do this stuff on your own, at your own pace in your own time mm -hmm. it's it's not a it's we're not building a coven of of followers of any kind it's mm -hmm. this is about empowering everybody for their own individual ability to master the energies of the universe it's mm -hmm. not about us being in charge of all of everybody else mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and interestingly what we found is that very few people will use this system on its own Virtually everyone who comes to us comes from a background. They might be Wiccans or shamans or alchemists. We, you know, we've even had Buddhists and Christians. And what they will do is that they will then incorporate our rituals into their own practices to enrich their own practices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're quite happy for them doing just that. Um, my aim is to have people working with the gods, bring, bring worship back to the gods, how people choose to do that. Um, is really up to them. I like to keep everything ancient and authentic, but if people prefer a more modern paradigm, then more power to them. All mm -hmm. I want to do is to have the gods given the respect and worship which they deserve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, there is a question in the chat room that it's about um, do, do equipment. Do you use any equipment in the rituals? And I'm thinking equipment, I'm thinking ritual tools or any kind of... Uh, ritual tools or anything no no um basically all all we have is um we, we burn a bit of incense we use essential oil and um we often have an altar of sorts but even that um isn't mandatory um we like to have some sort of eucharist in the ritual we'll have um some sort of sacred food some sort of sacred drink that, that participants can partake of mm -hmm. but it's really very very minimalist Mm -hmm. um, if you want to wear robes, by all means wear them. When I first started doing these rituals, I would always wear ritual robes. But um, quite often, um, when I run workshops, I don't have the luxury of putting on ritual robes. And I found that if I'm just wearing normal street gear, I, I can still get them to work. But if it's a um, if it's a full-on working group, then yeah, by all means wear wear ritual robes. You have to understand, Tony wears the color of the day every day. He does not wear synthetic clothing. He wears all natural fibers every yes. day. Yes, yes. Um, mag with us, magic is not something that we do um, once a month or, you know, every once in a while. We yes. do something on a daily basis. It's not some. It's it's you are magic. Magic is your life. Yeah. And Donald yeah. Michael Craig actually covers that in in the forward yes. to the book. Yes, he does. Yeah, yeah. And so as far as tools, as far as tools, I mean, if you really want to do something, then, you know, you can add candles. You can have. Um, we use the oils to anoint ourselves. It's not that we're burning the oil, but we can add it to the incense. Um, so you would want to have an incense burner. You would might want to have an oil burner. You might want to have a candle attributed to the color of the day or the god. I mean, it's it's really about what you want 
in your um, in your own practice. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not saying that you ha- you know we don't use wands. We don't use anything to um, focus any kind anything anything outside we want to you know bring all the energy into yourself mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you are the center of the work so that's, that's correct that's, yes uh, now uh, Joanne uh, let, let's look at some of your covers uh, this is not one of them I know but now. You do <laughs> by, the, by the way by the Go way ahead. I'm Carrigan you know that yes. this is there's a typo in Greek or Egyptian magic oh there is Ooh. not on the book but what you're putting up Oh really? What you is spelled it? it? You've spelled it wrong. It you spelled it um, G R E C O. Yeah, um, you've used the, you've used the American spelling of Greco. I I tend to use the um the English spelling, and you've misspelled Egyptian as well. Oh, I did. Yes. Oops. So, All right. <laughs> we, we, should, we should have mentioned we should have mentioned it earlier on, but we kind of figured that. No, no, get, that's fine. That's fine. Tell me, tell me, tell me. What what should I write? So it's, it's G R O. G-R-A-E, no, G-R-A-E, G-R-A-E, C-O, C-O, okay, G-R-A-E-C-O, and then Egyptian, what did E G Y, yeah, P T I A N. Change the C to a T. Yeah, all right. Okay, now how about that? Is that okay? <laughs> um, it hasn't come, oh, yep, that's it. <laughs> all right. Perfect. So... <laughs> <laughs> we got there in the end. Oh my god! <laughs> All right, so Brooklyn it's Domino. Real TV, guys. I know that's that's how it is. Brooklyn <laughs> Domino Domino Divination. This is one of your covers. It's absolutely this is stunning. one of my beautiful covers. I am really proud of this, and especially this one because these dominoes um, are are actually my family's dominoes. I sucked on them while I was teething. Oh. Um, Without realizing um, that on the back of them, there's actually pentagrams. Um, so it was, they're a pagan um, domino set that, have, um, that were a gift to my mother um, before my brother, who's 10 years older than me, was even born. So these are very old dominoes. The origination of them is unknown. Yeah. Um, but it, it they came to my family, so it wow. was we're supposed to have them, and we've had them ever since. And I've actually have them on my shelf right now. Um, but I used them in the book because I thought that it was the color would be really good for for a cover. Yeah, yeah, it's and absolutely it, fantastic. And it really wasn't until I was taking the pictures of the of the um, of the dominoes for the layouts that are included in the book. Um, that I realized that there was pentagrams on the back. <laughs> wow! <laughs> now tell me one thing about what about the water? What is what is this picture? Well, divination. I mean, it's 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 kind of you know I like to give. If you can judge a book by its cover, yes. okay. Well, they always say that. Well, I want to go against that. Mm-hmm. With my covers, you can judge it. If you're gonna like the cover, you're gonna like what's inside. There are elements of everything in the book on my covers mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted people to go ooh that's interesting looking and if they're interested in the cover they're gonna be really interested in the what's in the book in the so yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, yeah and um, uh, I felt that you know water has a lot to do with divination and um, to show how uh, I guess you kind of swirl into the divination anytime you you're you're looking into something, um, whether it be a crystal or anything. You just kind of have that feeling of swirling into it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's absolutely so. amazing. Now you do have another one here, which is called uh, "Sons of Air and Darkness." Um, by S. By S. P. Andrick, yes, uh, and this is another one from you. Yes. Um, well, the the cover, um, the image of uh, of the guy and the wings and everything that was actually done by another artist um, who's quite amazing and talented, and I don't have his name off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but he he's amazing and what I did was I took that and I gave um, the electric background and the text and everything and and the co- the the actual color of the background mm-hmm. to incorporate um, elements of the goddess that is actually in um, a part well a small character of the book mm-hmm. um, and that's the Morrigan yes yeah. so um, you know her wings her her aspect of 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 the crow and um, she, she it, it it's a great book if you like a little bit of vampirism plus a lot of Celtic history and um, SP weaves a story that is just amazing and I enjoy it's a delight for me she um, writes in a way that inspires me as an artist very very, very. Well, we we you have to if you're a cover artist, you know. <laughs> and sometimes sometimes you have to find inspiration, right? Cuz sometimes, you know, uh the cover doesn't really I mean the book you, you don't have to to sometimes you're you're employed and you have to kind of do the cover. Um, yeah, but when when I read SP's books and she's got another series out, um yeah. the Glastonbury Chronicles that I I adore and but she writes in a way that is so inspiring and you're when you're reading you can really see and hear these characters come yeah. to life in your head and um she's she's just amazing it's absolutely amazing i just love it i really do and this cover is just gorgeous it's absolutely unbelievable and this one too it's great 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 now uh what, did you did you chat with buckland on this um well um, not during my layout, but afterwards, he's he's really kind of. Um, I I was so pleased, and it, he brought tears to my eyes with how he loved the my layout and how he loved my cover. So I was um, kind of embarrassed, but I'm really happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, very good. Very good. I it's get wonderful. I get embarrassed easy if somebody gives me a compliment, but he he was so thrilled and I'm I'm so happy when when my authors are are pleased with my layouts or you know, because I don't I like to make books pretty. It's not just the cover. Yeah. If you open up the book, there are graphics that I do. Um and that's and my artistry is is all throughout the book. Mm-hmm. It's I, I want you to experience the book and the characters and the story with touching the book, with opening and looking and mm-hmm, smelling mm-hmm, the book. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's 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 something that can be done in print, and I'm h- currently converting all of these to um, to electric to to ebooks and things for the, for Nook and Kindle and iPads and iPhones and everything and it's a lot harder but I'm still you know the iBooks really are are very very st- it's 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 really difficult I mean the iBooks it's one of those things that you have to do every single step from the beginning and then you have to lay them down it's just like well uh, with the iBooks if you look at it if with Regular iBooks, um, yeah. they're they're like reading the newspaper. Oh, it I is. Yeah. To, I refuse to. I refuse to accept that. <laughs> Mine have images, guys. Yeah. This is you know my my title pages are are almost as pretty as my print books. Yes. So yes. Um, yeah. 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 I refuse to allow my books to be boring. Yeah. And yeah. and yeah. and everything needs to have character. Well, I thought that I thought I I was going to you you just explain it and you talked about it, but it, because I was going for the electronic thing after you said, oh, smell the book and open the book, uh, and <laughs> I was going to be like the, you know, the bastard. What about electronic box? You know, but um, you know the the, an- <laughs> the, the question about gotcha. the yeah, but uh, but yeah, you did. So the thing is that how how do you see now these? You know, you have clearly a passion for books, books than for electronic. You know, more than electronic. How you, how are you finding it? You know, y- yourself working in these electronic pieces. Um, do you feel that you can still love them even though they're electronic? Um, I have decided to since I decided not 
to allow my books to be boring and newspaper. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I can still, you know, include elements to, um, I mean, they're not as extravagant as the print, of course, but with um, advancement in our, our in our ebooks, then um, we'll be allowing more fonts in the future, and it'll, they'll become more advanced, and eventually, I think, one day, we will have the ability to have just as pretty um, ebooks as we have in print, but mm -hmm. um, it's going to take us a little while. The iPad has more fonts available now mm -hmm. than Nook and um, and Kindle, oh, but mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm basically laying out for the iPad, and then Kindle will um, adjust the fonts to whatever fonts they have available. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's it's actually um, not that difficult. Um, I'm hoping that one day the size of the files will increase. That's yes. the important part yeah, because absolutely. this way the imagery can be a little more advanced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Tony and Joanne Mearswicki. 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 And um, uh, talking about, you know, art covers, um, talking about Greco Egyptian magic, a great combination, don't you think? Uh, empowered, empower, uh, empower, everyday empowerment. Um, you know, and and these are the things that we, you know, th these are the passions that people have, and and we do have. Um, you know, it's uh, books, and um, you know, me, it's these um, communications. So you know, we all have our things. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> you know, so. Um, Wonderful, wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for both of you, from both of you, to be here Thank and to you. share your wisdom and kindness with us um, and explain all of these wonderful things, you know, uh, with with all of us. And um, we have a lot of people listening, so it's a great thing to have you here. Now, um, what is the next project, Tony? Um, as I said before, I'm trying to get my book Reconstructing Classical Greek Religion finished and once I get that finished mm -hmm. I'll then go to the sequel to Greco Egyptian Magic so people will have a complete system of theurgy using the um the the practices of Greco Egyptian Magic very good so um and this will be uh, published by who do we know um well Actually, I'm I'm not supposed to talk about the publisher just yet, but but yes, it will be um, a, a fairly large publisher who wants to do the book on um on on Greek religion. Okay. But um, it's prob good. probably not a good idea to to mention them just yet uh, un That's until fine. the ink is dry on the contract. That's great. So the other thing is, uh, I I like that metaphor. Until the ink is dry on the contract, um, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, now. Uh, we will have you back twice, I think, because, you know, as long as you keep writing, we'll keep having you. And um, also Joanne. So, um, you know, I really want you to, um, next time you come, you know, on, on Rich Talk, to give us a little bit of uh, a perception. We didn't have time to, to, to talk about it. Um, a perception of, of your workshops and how does it work and how, you know, how people react to it. Where do you or where are you located? I mean, if people want to contact you or if they wanted to go to one of your workshops, where do you move along? But you know, the sp geographically, where are you? Okay, we're based in Orange County, California, um, specifically Huntington Beach. However, we do travel throughout California. Um, we tend to be based largely in Southern California, but we do travel up north. Mm -hmm. um, so, for instance, we're at Pantheon um, just a couple of weeks ago. That's in San Jose, and we will be going back to Theurgicon um, in a couple of months' time. That's a small conference that's put together by the organisers of Pantheon to promote the practice of theurgy, mm -hmm. and that will be held in Berkeley. Very nice, very nice. I like that. Hmm. So, if people okay. wanted to meet us in Northern California, then you know we're always up the coast for um, Theurgicon and, and Pantheon. But if people want us to run workshops on the planetary initiations, then, um, you know, and they have a group, we're happy to travel to them. Um, if it's out of state, of course, it would be something that, um, you know, finances would have to be worked out. 
Yes, of course. Of course. Wait, I mean, <laughs> as you know, we've traveled very extensively in the past. Um, yes. it, it's all listed on the website. So mm. we've traveled throughout throughout mm. the United States. We mm. love meeting people. Um, mm. Actually, travel has been a blessing to us because we've met so many wonderful people. Oh, I'm sure. Um, across I'm the sure. United States. And, and we made look so forward many to meeting even more. And made so many friends, right? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's always good. It's always good to travel. I just love it. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they can, yeah. They can contact us on Facebook or through the website, you know. Yes. It's, we're, we're fairly um, available. You're very sociable. <laughs> yes, you we are. Tr we try. <laughs> oh, no, no, you are. You absolutely are. So, uh, Tony Muzwicki uh, and Joanne By Byers Muzwicki, um, you, you are in Facebook, both of you separately, and then um, do you have a page for your book? Actually, uh, not really. Not, not really. I, th I think hmm. Facebook automatically sets something up. but um, We hardly ever pay attention to that. It's yeah. better to catch us personally. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a little bit easier. Um, all right. So that's it. And, and then you have your absolutely fantastic website, which is www.hermeticmagic.com. And that's H uh, E R M E T I C magic with a K M A G I C K dot com. Um, and then you have, you know, everything about, you know, the book and the CD and Joanne and Tony and, you know, where all we of go these and yes. what we're up to. Yeah, yes, yeah I, I noticed. Amazing. I noticed it in the chat room. A couple of people don't like me spelling magic with a CK at the end. <laughs> um, it's I. I've always been a, a great admirer of, of Alistair Crowley, and um, it's probably more in homage to him than anything else. Yes, yes. It's well, also you know, you know to differentiate between sleight of hand magic and yes. um, and witchcraft. No, of course, of course. Um, I see it as a. I see it as a personal choice. Yes, it is a personal choice, and you know sometimes people really don't use it. Sometimes, sometimes people use it. Sometimes people say, "Well, magic will al was always spelled without a K. Why should we change it?" Uh, you know, <laughs> there's this kind of you know, there's all kinds of people, all kinds of things, you know. But um, you know, I also write. like it on an as an artist. A K is much more interesting than a C. Oh, no, absolutely, it is. Yeah, I know, I know. I just, I absolutely agree with you. Um, so, um, thank you very much for being here, guys. It was wonderful to have you here. Um, this is, uh, you know, I'm telling you, we're having, I'm just getting you, um, you know, put on your calendars. When you have the next book out, please, <laughs> please, um, please email um, Indigo or me. Uh, and tell us, hey, you, we have the book out. Do you want to do a witch talk? And we will have you. And the other one, which Thank hopefully you. Tony will be right <laughs> next to that one, uh, <laughs> we will we will have you again. So um, you know, so it it will be wonderful to have you again on Witch Talk. We'd love to come back on the show. We've had an absolutely fantastic yeah. time. You've Thank made you. us feel very welcome. We've You're had welcome. a really enjoyable experience. And the audience has been wonderful. It's wonderful, wonderful. So, you know that this is going to be, you know, recorded. People will, you know, but um, as the, the shows go on, uh, Ustream cut our, um, you know, uh, what is it called? Our storage. Um, so we have to delete them as we go along because we have to have only four shows. So four can we shows get a copy of those? So yes, can you can. Yes you, yes, you can. So don't go anywhere. It will be ready for you to download right after this, okay? Thank you, Thank very, you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Don't go anywhere. Don't hang out. Just stay there, okay? And We're not I'll, going anywhere. All right, all right. So uh, thank you, everyone, for being here on Witch Talk, and thank you for listening to this um, show uh, with uh, Tony and Joanne uh, Musviki. It was wonderful to have everyone in here, especially, you know, people in the chat room, Master Nestor, you know, Sikaras. It was wonderful to have everyone. Um, I just... Uh, I just enjoyed it so much. Now, next week, we'll have more Witch Talk for you. Until then, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Bye.